This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, where I'm extremely pleased to have a return engagement with Greg Hallett, who is my candidate for most interesting man in the world. I find Greg an endless source of fascination, and I'm just thrilled to have him here today. Greg, welcome back to The Real Deal. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. It's great to be back. It's been a while. It's been a while. I've been on a sojourn. Today, I'm doing a different tack. I've done some research, and I, I kept on finding things that were pointing to me. Now, I was wondering why I had been um, the royal biographer, and then when the books were done, I was immediately shunted, even betrayed, as though I was the main character rather than having the support role. So I've looked at where I lived and my surroundings and what's built around me when I'm living there, and they all seem to be pointers. I've never read the Bible, but I had a look at it last summer, about June. I sort of had an occupation that I was just had a lot of spare time. I was reading it, and I was reading it from the point of view of a lawyer reading a case and looking for the definitions of words and removing all of the waffle. What I was able to do was to decodify a lot of the Bible, and it says that it's actually about specific things and specific times and places and events. And I was able to decodify those events, and so many of them pointed to my story and my genealogical history that it had more than a coincidence, it had coincidence. So when you've got three or more things lining up, then it starts to look towards causation. And you're probably the best at defining at what point a scientist starts to look at causation because you've got a, you know, you're the professor of logic, <laughs> the emeritus professor of logic. Um, the last interview I did with you, I think, was Zeus's Thunder Oak, where the, the thunderbolt came and it split the oak tree and it split a third of it off and it left a standing figure in the tree trunk waving. When, when oak splits, it makes the sound, especially from thunder rather than lightning. There's no lightning. When it splits, it makes the sound apocalypse, right, when the oak's splitting, yeah, apocalypse, really loud. The sound sounds like the word apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. So the word apocalypse is actually an onomatopoeia. Yeah, it sounds yeah, like replicate the sound of the oak splitting. Yeah, it sounds like oak splitting. So then they say that there's four horses of the apocalypse, and they are white and pale and red and black. And just in the last week, I thought, hang on a minute. If you overlay all those colours together, it's brown, like the colour of wood. Right, so looking at four horses of the apocalypse. So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting because out of the oak tree came a horse. Wow! Right, very interesting. Very there's, there's, interesting. there's a horse in brown. Yes, yes. Right? Which is red, and it was a lot more red when it first came out. So if you look at it at different angles, you get to see uh, maybe it's yes. a man's face in there, and then there's a horse. And then there's Anubis, there's actually two horses. What it said in the Bible is that an 80-year-old man would be there in sleet and incense. So when I, when I got to the oak tree, because it was my profile oak tree, that I, I had my photograph in front of it, and it was exactly 777 metres from me, and 777 means the shin or forbidden secret, which I've been running. Yeah. And then the last benevolent king, the second last king of Rome, was called Servius Tullus. And he was a commoner, but he was raised in the royal household. And an oak split for him, and he grabbed two pieces of oak, called two rods of oak, and it changed his fortune, and he became went from being raised in the royal household as a commoner, like the son of a servant, to actually being the king of Rome, right? 
That's so quite, these, quite, these, a, quite an elevation. Quite, quite an elevation, yeah. That was an interesting story because what it says in the Bible is that when this apocalypse event happens, there'll be an 80-year-old man with a very sharp axe in sleet and incense. And what, what the sharp axe was was a chainsaw and he was 80, and it wasn't sleet, it was hail, <laughs> which is, you know, really plucking at straws. And uh, it wasn't incense, it was smoke, not a full fire, just smoke coming off the fire. So that was fantastically accurate. And then what they did when I moved here in 2015 is 15 years prior, they put up a steely, which is a stone object about one and a half metres high, about a metre wide and about a foot thick with carving on it from words and numbers and registering the place. And the numbers on it are wrong. The elevation's wrong and the location is wrong by 21 nautical miles, which is huge distance. But what it does do is say the exact time that I arrived and how old I would be when I arrived. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> And then they built a, um, a mulberry, which is a floating walkway. Mulberry was, a, um, it's a floating walkway over the mare, which is between a, halfway between a lake and a pond. And it's very deep. It's about 26 metres deep. So they couldn't put um, stilts down. And the person who invented the mulberry was a man called... Vice Admiral John Hughes Hallett, right? And the, the, the code for the mulberry is, the Bible code is, everyone will be amazed at how his name is John because there's no Johns in his family and there's no Johns in my family, but John Hughes Hallett is John Who's Hallett. Who's as in who's Hallett? Yeah, at who is, as who is. It's yeah. uh, Hughes, right? And the name Hughes Hallett, it's got no hyphen, and it was, it was created in about 1770, and the man had seven children. And he got a royal decree to have the name Hughes Hallett without any hyphen, right? It needed a royal decree. But he invented the mulberry a floating platform. So that fulfills another little niche. You just couldn't make it up because it's happening so far back in time. And then they built the floating platform in the Dismere, and it's got an elbow shape in it. It's got a right angle turn. And if you get the Sea of Galilee and overlay it over the Dismere, exactly the same place where the apostles supposedly rode out to Jesus, who was supposedly standing on water, and they picked him up and immediately they were on land. So it's as though the Bible predictions, or the Bible, is actually a series of predictions indicating some future time and place to name someone as things, names like son of man, all those words, I've got them all defined. The oldest science in Christianity, I'm looking at all this from a scientific coincidence point of view, the oldest science in Christianity is called typology theology. And that is where the events in the Bible are to happen at some future time in some other place. So the Bible is actually a series of predictions that no one's been able to understand because they're specific. So I've been looking at this and, and I've come across dozens and dozens of predictions that are entirely and specifically accurate right down to the moment I was born. That's all really, truly fascinating, my friend. I mean, stunning well, stuff. It's, yeah, well, you know, it's like, it's like my confidence in the subject wavers because it is so over the top in its accuracy. Well, it's no. esoteric to begin with and to be able to sort it out and discern to read the tea leaves, as it were, Greg, that's no mean feat in and of itself. 
Uh, absolutely. And the information has a habit of appearing and then disappearing. Uh, you might know that from your own research. It's, you know, it's sometimes information just disappears. It's there for a minute and then it's gone. That's particularly true of the Internet these days, Greg, where there's so much effort to suppress exposés of the government malfeasance. It's on a massive scale unprecedented in human history. Well, actually, the predictions that are found for the Mashiach or Messiah or Christ or Son of Man and all of those words and Holy Grail, etc., says that that will be the environment when this happens. Fascinating. Yeah, it, 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 it's quite specific. So what I've got is a slideshow on the topic of Mashiach, which is the Jewish Messiah, or Messiah, which is actually the English-speaking version, and the Greek-speaking version is Christ. And they're all loaded words, or they have been loaded words, and they might now become unloaded. I've got definitions for those words so that we know what we're talking about as opposed to, <laughs> you know, as opposed to getting um, carried away and all the holier-than-thou stuff. And, and the word hello means holy, by the way. The word holy is now hello. That is, that is the word holy. A lot of these things are, are really just simple, absolutely simple. What happened was there were predictions that needed to be kept in front of the public eye, so they built a religion around the predictions. Yes. You know, that's what happened. And the person who built the religion around the predictions was Emperor Constantine. And the emperor was actually the Pontius Maximus, meaning greatest priest. It wasn't the Pope. It was the Emperor Caesar, the warring guy, was the highest priest. Okay, so Meshach the Messiah. We're looking at the predictions, the Jewish predictions for the return of the Son of Man. And son of man, not son of God, son of man. Son of man and son of God are different things. The son of God is actually more common. If someone lives by the life force, which means does right, etc., he's the son of God. So you could be termed the son of God. But you help someone across the street, you're the son of God. So the predicted timetable for the return of the son of man, this is the um, Jewish version for the uh, Mashiach ben David, which is the son of David. And the son of David doesn't come genealogically. It comes from the bowels, which means secondary via initiation and via circumstance. Yes, sure. Yes. Okay. So I've got one at the top there, and then it goes through to six or seven. In the seven years prior to the Son of Man's birth, from September to September, which is the beginning and end of the Jewish civil year, the birth pangs of Messiah or Shevli Mashiach are, and it lists droughts, hunger, famine, neither famine nor plenty, prosperity, rumours of war, dread of war. And what I've done is I've looked at the droughts when they were, and I've looked at the hunger when it was, etc. And when the dread of war was, and then I've inserted the years and the events. So 1954 to 55 droughts. There was a drought in the 1950s, or the drought of the 1950s in America, went from 1950 to 57. So if you add seven years to that, we're looking at the years between 1957 and 1964. 1955 to 56 is hunger. There's food rationing begins to end, but it's replaced by petrol rationing. 1956 to 57, famine, mass deaths, renowned die, Torah forgotten in Israel. So there's the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. 15 to 30 million people died in a famine in China, began to die then. President of the World Union for Progressive Judaism, Leo Bayek, died. There was a whole lot of major deaths. I just listed one there that would be important to their cause. 
the tour is forgotten in Israel. And in that year, 1956, Israel invaded Jordan, Samaria, West Bank, Sinai Peninsula, Gaza, and the Straits of Tehran. 1957-58, neither famine nor plenty, so not newsworthy. 1958-59, prosperity, abundance, joy, revival of Torah in Israel, and that was the first Holocaust Memorial Day, so that would register for that. 1959-60, rumours of war, rumours of a cold war, 1960-61, dread of war, Berlin Wall was erected on 13th of August, 33 days before 15 September 1961, which is the day they end up naming. After all these signs have come to pass, at the end of the seventh year, the son of David will make his appearance. So that's in 1961. Two. Israel has four different New Years, and this is taken from 200 AD. It was what was recorded then. So there's the New Year for trees, there's the Ecclesiastical New Year, there's the New Year for the tithe of cattle, and New Year for years, the Civil New Year of release and jubilee for ordinary affairs. The latter Civil New Year for ordinary affairs is the most appropriate New Year to be born on the eve of the last possible moment, which is sunset, and that is Evet means Eve of Rosh Hashanah. So three, the son of man who next represents the end times new age will be born late on the eve of the Jewish civil new year, Yvette Rosh Hasana, in the year 5721 to 5722 crossover for the father's shin is fulfilled in the son. Now that's numbers code there. It corresponds to what years in um, AD? Early to mid-September, 1961. Okay, go ahead. 5721. If it was 3721, three sevens are 21, and 21 is the shin or forbidden secret, and it's the highest representation on earth. That's the code for the number. Because it's 5721, you've got another two sevens, and 77 means the father is fulfilled in the son. That's the code for it. So 5721 the code is the father's shin is fulfilled in the son. So it sound, the number is sounding quite biblical. And then plus three days and nights are exactly 72 hours in the belly of the whale. Right? And the belly is pleading the belly. When a, a woman pleads the belly like in court, it means that she's pregnant. So that's why they've got the story Jonah and the whale where he spends three days in the belly of the whale. It means he was born three days late. That's the code. The king making earth energies, because it says in the belly of the whale and, and in the earth. So the king making earth energies rendered eight kaisers, and I'll show you a slide of the tiles they built, because the, the, the Germans, believe it or not, the German royalty believed in dragon energy, underground energy moving through the earth. So they built tiles in their castle to capture, so the dragon energy would move through their tiles. They had these four-dimensional tiles. And that produced eight kings of Germany, eight Kaisers. And the 26th March 2010 film, How to Train Your Dragon, marked the beginning of the Fifth Roman Empire, which is called the Empire of the Holy Spirit. So the movie How to Train Your Dragon came out as a marker. And a lot of movies that we have, even the titles and also the subject matter, are markers for biblical events. Because what's happening is the Freemasons are in charge of entertainment and the Freemasons are enacting the Bible to the letter, almost all of it, and they've told me this. I said to them, are you enacting the Bible to the letter? And he said almost with only a few minor exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> so if you work out what the Bible codes actually mean, then you've got a very good grasp of what's going to happen next. And some of the turmoil that we're experiencing now is what's predicted in the Bible so that the Freemasons, who are the, the world's middle managers, are enacting it. It's purposeful. It's got a purpose.
Matthew 12, 40 is the whale and the belly of the whale, so the person should have whaling ancestors or some relationship with whales. And the king of the south, so as far south as habitable for the king of the south, he should be a targeted individual closest in age to Jesus on the 3rd of April, AD 33, versus the age of the 1st of January, 2001. 3rd of April, AD 33 was supposedly the crucifixion date, but I don't believe it was crucifixion. It was actually a Heb Sed festival. It was actually a celebration. And the Heb Sed festival was a celebration for pharaohs. And once a pharaoh had been in power for 30 years, he got a Heb Sed festival where he'd run around a rectangle and everyone would be cheering furiously. And then he'd go into the pyramid and he would be given some ceremony, possibly a concoction, to have an out-of-body experience to get some new information to help the Ma'at, M-A hyphen A-T, which is the harmonious survival of the society. Right. So that was the Heb Sed Festival. And there's indications that the crucifixion was actually a a hazing, like a university hazing. And if you look at the descriptions of the words, lancement, like a long lance, lancement is the French word for initiation, and pierce meant to bruise the feet, so hitting the feet like, like that harsh. You know? It was a hazing. There's no mention of a cross in the original text. It was a gibbet, which is a scaffold. So he's strung up on a scaffold. There's no mention of nails. It's just like a bit of leather around a scaffold, piercing with beating the hands and feet, in this case the feet, and being pierced with a long lance was actually an initiation and not being pierced at all. So when you get down to the, the words, it actually becomes a whole different scenario. So they're looking for... Target of ind individual closest in age to Jesus on the 3rd of April, AD 33, versus in 2001, so within 77 days. Born on Jesus' official birthday, 15 September, which fits in with the Rosh Hashanah. And Jesus had a lot of royal lineage, and, and a lot of the critics from even the 1800s have said that it's actually a book about a prince claiming his throne. He was supposed to be conceived in December, the preferred date for conception in December was the 10th, 11th of December, and that would most likely create a birth on the 15th of September. But Jesus was actually born, or Yeshua, was actually born on the 1st of March. So <laughs> someone couldn't wait. Either Joseph, Mary, or God. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't wait. <laughs> so anyway, he was born in March. March was Pisces, and it was he was bringing in the age of Pisces because what he was actually doing was representing the end times and the new age. And it's, there's 40 days for each, and there's a headset ceremony somewhere in there. And the other prediction is born into an adulterous generation, which is known as the swinging 60s. So adulterous generation is written in Matthew 12, 39. So that means born in the 1960s. That's why it's called the swinging 60s. And born into an evil generation with corporal punishment, caning, whipping on stage, etc. In Israel, the end of Evet Rosh Hashanah was the 11th of September 1961 at 6.50 p.m. GMT plus 2, and that's sunset. And in New Zealand, this was the 12th of September at 4.50 a.m., which is GMT plus 12. And New Zealand and Israel both did not have daylight saving and then both got daylight saving at the same time in the years 1974-75. So plus the three days or exactly 72 hours in the belly of the whale is the 15th of September 1961 at 4.50 a.m., GMT plus 12, which is my birthday in time. Just astonishing. <laughs> just astonishing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So according to the Jews, 
oh, the Hebrews, <clears throat> the people in Israel, I'm the son of man and the Meshach ben David. Fascinating. Yeah, it's great. Are they likely to acknowledge as much? Well, it's arguable they already have and have been all the way along, and that's why they've been doing things like building the floating platform on my birthday where Jesus walked on the on the lake, exactly where he walked on the lake. So uh, I think they've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> it's all <laughs> truly astonishing, my friend, truly astonishing. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm open to all challenges too. I very much like <clears throat> religious leaders to come and test me. So, part four. In the second century BC, Midrash Song of Songs, the commentary, prior to the coming of the Messiah, the world will be terribly corrupt. There will be no compassion amongst men, great derision and contempt for the Torah the Old Testament of the Bible, and for piety will be universal and truth will be almost unknown. Does that sound like today? It certainly does. <laughs> Men will be as shameless of their evil doings as the very animals and the few righteous who still exist will be in exceeding great distress. Persecution will be rife everywhere. The youth will have no respect for the age so that the aged will even rise before the presence of the young. The daughter will rebel against her mother, and a man's worst enemies will be those of his own household. The reigning powers will become infidel, and none will be found to raise his voice in protest, so that mankind will seem to merit naught but extermination. If, therefore, we behold the generations becoming ever more corrupt, there is therein good reason to anticipate the advent of the Messiah. This is between 100 and 200 AD. Just astonishing. I mean, one wonders, could those claims be made for all periods of human history or more distinctly and decidedly the present? Well, I think things like the daughter will rebel against her mother has been happening since maybe the late 60s. I think a lot of the righteous people do the right thing are feeling persecuted under great stress. I think that's happening. Shameless of the evil doings is just all over the media now. That's the entire theme of the alternative media is shameless evil doings. Truth will be almost unknown. We've got to really struggle to get any truth out. We've got to put a lot of effort in and say the same story 20 times over, you know, to get people to pick up on it. And uh, the world will be terribly corrupt. It's just, just, I think we're in the most corrupt times ever. It's just phenomenally corrupt. The reigning powers will become infidel. I think that's quite true because monarchies all around the world now are just being shown to be heroin trafficking mafias involved in all sorts of nasty stuff. Five. The end times New Age changeover will be at 144,000. Now, if you look at the Bible, I'm sure it's a massive reading. <laughs> They're huge. This is a, a historic edition of the Bible you have there, Greg. I think this is about 1870. Just as an example, if you get one of these big Bibles, what you get an extra is you get... Oh, the top two thirds is text and the bottom third is notes. From there down is all notes. Yeah. So what it says about the fabled 144,000 supposedly being 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And what the Bible notes say is, no, someone made that up. There's no basis for it at all. And the 144,000 comes from 1.44 p.m., it's actually 2.44 in the day, but that's GMT plus one. It's actually 1.44 p.m. is the time of the end times New Age changeover. And that was actually recorded in the bottom of the sketch of the true likeness of Sir Walter Raleigh, who got the book of predictions. He went on a piracy tour to Cadiz in Spain and Faro in Portugal and from Faro, he got the book of predictions, and he could read in six languages. So he broke the predictions 
and wrote them down like it's an image of Swarth Rally and he's got a, a little book open. If you twist it round and make it square, you double it up, you get to see the codified message. And he was saying that the predicted end times new age was at 2.44, which is GMT plus one, which is 1.44 p.m., 0. 0.0 seconds. And the other 144,000 is the speed of Halley's Comet was going at 144,000 miles per hour. And also the speed of Category 1 Hurricane Jose was at 144,000 metres per hour, which is where you get the saying, sung like a virgin that no man could make the sound. It's when the hurricane's howling, you can't sing like that, you can't imitate that sound. It's quite a fascinating sound. It sounded like a virgin, no man could sing like that. So that's the 144,000. So that's a predicted time that the Son of Man will represent the new age. This happened at 1.44 p.m. GMT on Saturday the 16th of August 2014, based in the Algarve, Portugal, Porto Grail, Portugal, Port of the Grail. So I was chosen to co-represent the end times and then I ended up representing the new age. The speed attributed to the hurricane, could a hurricane possibly move so rapidly? 144,000 metres per hour is 144 kilometres per hour. What they do is they write one thing to mean lots of things. Yes. I predict a timetable for the return of the Son of Man. So here is some definitions. Mashiach, Messiah, Christos, Christ, Anointed One, and the Son of Man are interchangeable. Christ means high priest of all good things. And Antichrist means high priest of all bad things. So Mashiach, Christ, and Messiah mean King of the Righteous, anointed by signs of serendipitous synchronicity. It doesn't actually say the words, the phrase serendipitous synchronicity, but that's what it amounts to, is that there's constantly signs. And it says that the signs for the Messiah or the Mashiach or the Son of Man will end in 2017, which they did. It's quite accurate. So Hebrew Aramaic, the name of Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua, Joshua, Hosea. And the Greek, that's Jesus or Jesus, and in English that became the son of Zeus, Jesus, Lord, King, Redeemer, Salvation. All those things are interchangeable. The Hebrew Mashiach is the Greek Christos, which is the English Messiah, and Ha means the, so Hamashiach is the Christ and the Messiah. And they are basically all king of the righteous, anointed by signs of serendipitous synchronicity. So what they have to do, what the Messiah, Christ, Mashiach, Son of Man, Anointed One has to do is be able to show signs that are beyond his own manufacture, like civic buildings, civic structures, the weather. Yeshua Hamashiach is Jesus Christos, which is Jesus the Messiah. And at the end of the day, it's the person that represents the end times new age. That is what it's all about. Take away all the garbage and all the dogma and all the blah, 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 blah. don't really know what we're talking about. This guy will refer to this guy, will refer to this guy, will refer to this guy. We'll spell this one on a bit different. Everyone will be confused. It's all about representing the end times and new age. So it's not the Alpha and Omega the first and the last, it's the Omega and the Alpha. It's the last and the first, end times in the new age. All of what I've shown you, this is it on one sheet. Fascinating. And that's it in white on black, black on white. And just here's my birth certificate. I've taken a whole section out and squashed it so it will fit on the screen better. There's my birthday there, 15 September 1961, which is Rosh Hashanah, 
Yvette plus at exactly sunset to the minute plus exactly 72 hours. My birthday again on the passport. 15th September 1961. And there's the birthday down here on the number there as well. L610915. So the Messiah is fat. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says. Isaiah fifty two fourteen. As many were astonied, which means astonished at the him, his visage he looked was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So many were astonished. His image less than perfect and overweight, reaching the weight of two men during the tribulations, which is two thousand and ten to twenty especially during the end times, the times of the end, which is 2014 to 17, when myself reached 21 stone 10 pounds, being two 10 stone 12 pounds, which was my normal weight up to the age of 33. So I was the size of two of me. <laughs> right, so it actually predicts that during the tribulations, he'll swell up in size. Palm 22.22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation, will I praise thee. Now, congregation just means a group of people focused on the same thing, like a rugby match, soccer match, gridiron match, a movie. It doesn't mean... Church, it's a congregation of people watching Formula One racing, whatever. Translating the words, I, I will declare, I will recommend and trust, declare and praise, Mashdak Ben Joseph, which is the Christian one, and illustrate how this came together among interested people in the midst of the congregation via signs and films. So I've been in via signs and sometimes actually being named. I've been in Rome holiday before I was born, 1953. Quick draw McGraw is called Pepe Legal in Portugal. Pepe is a petite nom for Jose or Joseph. So in Portugal, Quick draw McGraw was Joseph Legal. And the end of the opening credits has the guy catching the chest full of raw marks that Queen Victoria gave us in 1850. I'll show you! Oi! Come on! Oh, that's hell, come on! Yep, and there's more kabongs! Where are that kabong kabong to throw? The FBIO Gallop and all the way there goes Quick Draw McGraw. Quick Draw McGraw. The FBIO Gallop and all the way there goes Quick Draw McGraw. The La Noite, which is the night, that was 1961. That gives my genealogical background and actually names my Portuguese ancestry. The Holy Grail, Monty Python, the Holy Grail, 1975, names me Gregory Hallett, 777, written on the wall. Really? Yeah, look. What does it say? Gregory Hallett 777 Holy Grail is running the shin and representing the end times. Well, that's what's carved in the rock. The life of Brian names me as the chosen one and the son of man. We have come from the east. 
he is the Son of God, our Messiah, King of the Jews. That's Capricorn, is it? No, 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 that's just him. By what name are you calling him? Quick! Lay your hands on him! Quick! The X-Men series is about the Wolverine. The Wolverine's name is James Howlett, and he was created in September 1963 when I was two. In the last movie, in Logan, his name is changed to from James Howlett to Joey Howlett, which is the same as my name, Joseph Howlett. Joseph Howlett. And then at the same time that Wolverine was being filmed, the military came around here and took me to hospital, and I was screaming so loud with kidney stones because I was so overweight. <laughs> That they recorded my name as Howlett. I've got the wrist label too to show Howlett. The Crown Hospital changed my name to Howlett, which is the same. So my name is Joseph Howlett, and the Wolverine's name was Joseph Howlett. Great, this is just stunning stuff. And then in 2017, I was in Logan, that's an extension of Wolverine, and then I was in Baby Driver, and then as in The Mummy, where the mummy who plays Isis says, Hallett, you are my chosen. Joseph, do you accept? Earlier on in the movie, it's established that safe Papayich means my chosen. <laughs> my chosen Hallett. Cruz turns as though Hallett is his name and chosen is his status. <laughs> Ben, two to air. Anem. Ben equals son of. Son of the two to air. I name you. Ben, two to air. Anem. Iwak air. Joseph Tayefset. The hair requires an E in each name. And as in Joseph Gregory Pellet. The Egyptian Trinity with Joseph Hallett as Horus. Pursuit. Predictions in pursuit. Ben, you were here. Should have been. Son, you are here. Should have been enough. Day of awakening will soon be upon us. They will kill you, just as they killed my chosen before you. You brought my chosen here. What do you think they will do with him now? Welcome to a new world of gods. We wait for that day to arrive. Which brings me to you. Yeah, yeah great, yes. What's your plan? These things are complex, and one is dealing with the salvation of humanity. Certain sacrifices must be made. The interesting thing is that the guy who played Wolverine, Hugh Jackman, and the guy who plays the main character in The Mummy is Tom Cruise. And Tom Cruise and Hugh Jackman are neighbours on the bluff overlooking Byron Bay. So they're sitting there having a barbecue and they go, who should we, who should we name as the son of man? Palm 2230. One of the princely line having a long history transferred from Persia to New Zealand in 250 BC. A planted Holy Grail seed. Holy Grail is an anagram of Gregory Hallett. Wow. Set to be born or flower on the title king set day, 15 September 1961. Tended by a grail gardener, so there's been you know a bit of guidance with the two keys of St. Peter. Now, St. Peter is pictured with two keys, right? And this is the secret is to have these two keys, and I, I only have two keys, and my two keys are 
the same two keys as, as pictured on St. Peter's feet. Exactly that. <laughs> wow. The Persia story is interesting because what happened was India invaded Persia in 250 BC and Persia held the princely line, which is the Martuk line. It's written M-A-R-D-U-K. It's, it's written Marduk, but it's pronounced Martuk. And the princely line of Persia went to New Zealand in 250 BC and lived there and they built 400 miles of canals in New Zealand, like stone earthworks, bringing water in, purifying the water, massive gardening, etc. And then the Chinese came in 1422, and then a comet hit off, you've got North Island, South Island, Stewart Island, and 100 miles southwest of Stewart Island, this comet hit, poof, and created a tidal wave so high that 500 metres up on Stuart Island, there's shellfish shells. And there were Chinese junks that were 550 yards long, 170 yards wide and six storeys high with about 20 masts on them, and they actually got washed. Some of them got washed from New Zealand to Australia. Served a tidal wave. And there's about 40 Chinese junks, wrecks around New Zealand, and some of them you can see at low tide, at extreme low tides. And these things were massive. They were the size of football stadiums. So the Chinese, as soon as they got there, they got hit by a tidal wave. When the Maoris arrived 1,975 years after the Persians in 1725, they were actually commissioned by the Catholic Church to kill everyone in New Zealand. So they got all the people that weren't wanted from the Pacific Islands, all the, the, the headhunters and the sociopaths and psychopaths and the people who couldn't guard and the people who couldn't fish and the, the murderers and the military men and the ugly women. And they said, okay, if you go down to New Zealand, kill everyone, you can have New Zealand. You can have it. Because the Catholic Church wanted the princely line dead because it's easier for the Catholic Church to control royal families that are not legitimate. So the Murrays went down from the north, top of the North Island all the way down to the bottom of the North Island and all the way down the South Island and killed everyone, just slaughtered everyone. In one place there was 60,000 people killed. When the Whites arrived in about 1800, there was one million, at least a million skeletons scattered on the ground, just not buried, just scattered there, been there for 75 years. And then in 1920, the skeletons were ground up into fertiliser and sprayed all over the land. So this was the Persian line. Now, right at the bottom of the South Island on the southwest coast, there's a bit of grassland and then some steep mountainous hills and that was where the Persians survived and they surrounded themselves with a little bit of don't tell anyone Maori. Those Persians survived as Naitahu. That was the name of the tribe, Naitahu. And the Maoris don't know where Naitahu came from. That was because Naitahu are the Persians and they were there before the Maori. But even the Maori texts, which you can find online, they say that the people of the land, which is called Tangata Whenua, the people of the land are the Toi, which are the Persians, T-O-I, and there were multitudes of them. And there's a plant in New Zealand which has multiple stems of white feathers coming out of it, like Prince of Wales feathers, which is appropriate, and that's called Toi Toi because it's got a multitude. So the Toi were the multitude of people that were in New Zealand before the Maori. Right, and the toy say uh, the Maori's records say that the toy are the Tangata Fenua, the people of the land, and their representatives are the Tuhoi, which is a, a Maori tribe. And it's got its own land still, still quite native, it's still go horseback. That meant that as Naitahu, I'm Naitahu, that all I had to do was get a letter from, say, the Queen of England, saying assemble him claimant, 
and then having, say, the Sangreal, the blood royal descendant of the Jesus Mary lineage, have the highest physical sword in the world and touch it to my heart and then give me the walking stick of the king for the day and then use that and touch my heart with it. So all, all of that's happened. All of that has happened? Yeah, I'll show you the photographs. With Victoria Regina's letters, there are no coincidences and nothing in them was perchance. They were designed purposefully, then placed in the hands of those destined with rightful kingship to be played out over generations so that there would be no question or imitators. Yours entirely intimus, assemble him claimant, Queen Victoria, Hanover Gotha, March 17, 1850, London, Kensington. So there's the sword of the Duke of Sachsen Coburg and Gotha held in my heart by the Sangreal, the Blood Royal. It's Queen Victoria's great, 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 great grandson. How, how did that come to pass? I was getting knighted Lord Chancellor of the Kingdom of England. So there's actually quite a lot of recognition of your place in history. Yes. Things have changed since I've been making the claims and saying the story, and it all fits. Gradually, gradually coming to accept the plausibility of your claim. Absolutely. The resistance has been gradually, gradually dissolving or crumbling. Well, yeah, it's been dying off and falling away. Prince Harry has named his two dogs Guy and Oz as the guy from Australasia. Princess Diana made sure that Prince Harry had the same birthday as me. And Harry is a hallet. Hewitt. He's a Hewitt. A Hewitt, rather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James Hewitt's nickname was the CAD, C-A-D, CAD. And Diana named Prince Harry Henry Charles Albert David, which is Harry CAD. Prince Harry CAD, to confirm that he was the son of the CAD, James Hewitt. You know, we have an MI5 fellow now saying he's on his deathbed that he was responsible for taking out Diana in Paris. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I didn't believe it. Well, you do believe she was murdered. Uh, I've, I've got no evidence of death. There's me with the sword of the Duke of Sachsen Coburg Gotha, which is the second highest sword on the planet. The other highest sword is Moses' sword, El Shaddai, but I'm not sure if that exists. I think it might actually be environmental terrorism and not a sword. Where were you holding the sword? That's me in the royal town of Sintra in Portugal, about 25 minutes. Is that where the sword is archived? No, 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 no. The, the sword, this first time in 80 years that the sword's been brought out. It might have been brought out once before in 80 years. So it's been under lock and key. But they allowed you to take it out? Well, they actually gave me the sword and demanded that I sleep with it overnight and then hold it up to the castle in the morning, which I did. That was my initiation in the House of David. Here's the sword there. Great. This is just astonishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's my co-author, Francisco. That's Queen Victoria's great, 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 great grandson. And he's got the walking stick of King John II of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and all Ireland, Prince Marcus Manuel, who actually had the title Christ. It was one of his titles. So Prince Marcus Manuel, King John II of the United Kingdom, had the title Christ, and a Templar Grandmaster who has achieved gnosis or knowing is allowed to use the title Christ, but none have because they knew of Prince Marcus Manuel. This is my balcony of my hotel room, and the castle that I was to hold the, the sword up to is in the skyline up here, and that's Moorish Castle. And Moorish 
is the root word of mulberry and King David hid under a mulberry tree twice. So by holding up the arguably the, the highest sword in the world up to Moorish Castle, it was my initiation into the house of David via secondary means, which the Bible says via the bowels, but it means via circumstance and via initiation. Stunning. Yeah. So there's me with a walking stick. There's me with the King of England's walking stick. There's me receiving this raw mark here. That's the castle. And this is Moorish Castle here on the right-hand side. So it's got an aspect of giants about it. And there's the nice sunset photo of the light shining through the glass like a holy grail. So that kind of means that I'm the King of New Zealand, or rather Prince Regent Duke Governor of New Zealand. And I have a, um, a mark here of the Prince Regent Duke Governor of the ports of the Algarve. That's looking promising. You were a threat to established authority. I mean, is there any, any prospect of your being so recognized by New Zealand? What happens is the Holy Grail holds the values during the tribulations, and then ultimately that person's values become the values of the next age, the next long year, which is about 2,160 years. Socialism is about absolutely no values. Socialism has no values. It doesn't value anything. Socialism was brought in at the end times, new age, changeover to attack the Holy Grail, to try and stop the predictions about the Holy Grail and the Son of Man from manifesting. Presumably that can't work. Well, that's what socialism is, and most governments are now socialist. Most governments have absolutely no values at all. All will be answered. All will be answered. This is just overwhelming. I mean, the detail, the thoroughness of your documentation. I mean, I cannot imagine an alternative interpretation that could encompass all of these data points. Part of the test of, of kingship is can you get all of this into some reasonable... Coherent narrative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So here's a coherent narrative. So this is Sir Walter Raleigh, and in July 1596, he went to the cave that I lived in in the Algarve. Then he went back, he translated the book, and he summarized it in a one-page sketch called the Rosicrucian Cosmography. In it, on the top left corner, you can see in white, it's got colon 604. Yeah, yes. Boy with a snake. Now, 604 was the year that Pope St. Gregory the Great died. The number that they used to signify people was their death year, not their birth year, because often there weren't birth records. So 604 means Gregory, and the colon means second name Gregory. My name's Joseph Gregory, so by having colon 604, they're naming me. Do, do continue. What I've done here is I've mirrored the images. I like it. The colon 604, and then Pope St. Gregory the Great. And then mirrored on the other side, colon 604 reads as cross or plus AD1 or AD colon. Just fascinating. So if we look, it's got the name of God up here, Yahweh, and in Christian context, God is the Father, Jesus is the brother. So the father, and the father's name, Jesus' father's name is Joseph, so that's code for Joseph. And Joseph is considered the highest name. And here it's written high up on the page. So here you've got colon 604, and then in reverse it's 81, as though the person called Joseph with the second name Gregory 
was going to represent the new age. You represent a new age, my friend. You represent a new age, my friend. You represent a new age, my friend. See the star here? It's got a circle in it. And I've got written Prince Regent, Duke Governor. Yes. This is the mark that exactly fits that. Ah. Yes. And this is the mark of the Prince Regent, Duke Governor of Portugal, which means to be king of and then to the other side, male and female Sangreal gave me this raw mark before I saw this Rosicrucian cosmography and before I represented the end times and new age, which is very interesting. Now, here's the view from the cave, and you see the Noah's Ark here on top of this rock, on top of this cliff, pointy rock on the right-hand side. Oh, yeah, sure, yes. See how that, see that straight but on the right-hand side of it on an angle? And you see how the, this rock here is exactly the same? How extraordinary. And see the way the ship's there? Quite a few coincidences here. So Walter Raleigh spent 14 hours in my cave drawing it. He drew this rock and he put a ship on top of it. And the sword points to the rock. And there's me with the sword of the Duke of Saxon, Coburg and Gotha. Also wow. pointing to the rule. So Sir Walter Raleigh's my great, 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 grandfather. I took a photo booth shot of me. It's not, I probably actually look more like him now. With You do. So how, how is he? How is he? He's, um, great. You look much more like him now. So there you go. Even with the beard and mustache. Yes, yes. This resemblance will be far more striking. He's got the same lip. He's got similar cheekbones, similar forehead. Yes, yes, yes. Similar hair. Um, yeah, so he's a relative. You know, so what he did is he got the book of predictions and he codified the book of predictions. He translated it and then he realized it predicted me. So he bred himself into my family. Fascinating. So there you go. Right by side next to you now. The resemblance is much more striking. Yeah, yeah, and I agree. Oh, the other thing is Walter Raleigh, if you take out the initial letters, W and R, it reads I Grail Hallett. Absolutely sensational. That was fascinating. It forcefully confirmed my characterization of you as the most interesting man in the world. I mean, I'm just astonished by this, Greg, and the, 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 the complexity, the detail, the historicity, the way it all fits together. It's just dumbfounding. Thank you. Yeah, but it's good to get it out there. You know, it, it, it seems to be stacked up. Like oh, it's fascinating, Greg. Absolutely fascinating. Just stunning stuff. I, yeah. uh, I can't well, thank you enough for this opportunity, my friend. Really, truly yeah. fascinating. I haven't shown you um, the walking on water bit yet, so that's always amusing. It's a big sort of catch-all. <laughs> Greg, I'm, I'm, I'm just stunned, blown away, absolutely fascinating. I can't thank you enough for this opportunity. It was Jim Fetzer, your host on the, the Real Deal with the extraordinary Greg Hallett, my candidate for the most interesting man in the world. Thank you so much for being here, Greg, and to all of you for watching. You look um, so much like Sir Walter Raleigh, I'm telling you. I know, I know, I know. Um, what, they've, what they've done is, if you could imagine that someone from 500 years ago, 400 years ago, 2,000 years ago could look through my eyes, record what I was seeing, and then write it down on a prediction, that's about what has happened. <laughs>